Hello, everybody. My name is Lee Orff. I'm an atmospheric scientist at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm going to be giving you a keynote address today about data management. And I know this is a conference on reproducible workflows, data management, and security, but I have focused much of my career on um, managing data, actually, as an atmospheric scientist in order to facilitate very high-resolution simulations. And that's kind of what it, uh, what it boils down to for me. So in this talk, I'm going to give you a sort of look back in time over across my career and my actually my childhood because how I got to where I am today is a big function of things that happened early on. Um, I'll talk about the different processes that uh, I've used in order to manage large amounts of data. It's been kind of a common theme throughout my career. And finally, I will um, talk about sort of a, a, a workflow that I've come up with and a file system essentially made up of individual files that I call LOFS and, and then talk about the path ahead as it's a very, inter it's a very interesting time right now. And um, with computing uh, going to GPUs and machine learning and, you know, data is, is the thing. <laughs> we have lots of data. So briefly, um, my career, uh, education, Etc. cetera, I, um, I got my Bachelor of Science degree in Meteorology in, in UW-Madison in 1990, and that's where I am now. I also got my PhD at UW under John Anderson, who uh, left academia to work for uh, work on Skywalker Farm up with George Lucas and ILM, and later went on to work for Pixar and now works at Google. Um, big into visualization and simulation. Uh, I became an assistant professor at UNC Asheville in 2000, and that was a point in my career where I was kind of fed up with research and I just wanted to teach, and I did for a year, and I did for several years actually, but after my first year, I started to get the research itch again. I wanted to, after making it through a whole year of new preps for undergrads, I was ready to do research again, and one day in probably May 2001, I picked up the phone and I called Robert Wilhelmson, who's uh, one of the pioneers of high-resolution cloud modeling in the atmospheric sciences. He's somebody who my advisor, John, had worked with, and I had worked with on a, on a similar project or a, a different project a few years before. And I said, hey, Bob, you know, I'm, I'm just made it through my first year at UNCA. I'm wondering if you got any research going on where I could be involved. Essentially, I was looking for a connection, try to keep in, uh, keep in the research, uh, the R1 type mode in research. I, I knew I always wanted to do super high resolution cloud modeling and I knew I was gonna need some help to get there. Um, after three years at UNCA, I went to Central Michigan University, which was a bigger school, closer to Wisconsin, kind of where I, where I wanted to sort of end up, I think, up at the upper Midwest. And I, I made it th through a full professor and I was chair of the department for my last three years there. That's also when my research kind of uh, blew up in the tornado work that I'll be talking to you a little bit about today. Currently, I'm a research scientist at UW-Madison at the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellites Studies and the Space Science and Engineering Center, um, where I've been for the last six years or so. So, okay, I'm a meteorologist. I work on computers. I use a lot of data. I'm going to talk to you about something that happened when I was five years old. Namely, our house got hit by lightning. And it was July 5th, 1974. How do I know this? I was only five years old after, uh, after all. Well, I talked to my dad and we figured it out. Um, I went into the newspapers and here you can see the headlines of the Springfield Union on July 6th, 1974. Electric storms, cut off power drench regions, lots of lightning, 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 power outages, three children hit by lightning, lightning kills swimmer in Central Park. And if you look down at the bottom, the words of wisdom from Mrs. LePage, you know they're going to be afraid of lightning now. Yes, Mrs. LePage, I am still afraid of lightning from that event. Um, it was very, very traumatic. My, my mother couldn't hear for a couple days because she was standing right by the window when the, when the lightning bolt came through, came through the antenna, blew out uh, part of the wall in my sister's bedroom, lots of insulation, glowing wires, uh, burning, paneling, the whole nine yards. Nobody was, was permanently injured. We, all, we were all fine, and there was a very small fire. But boy, did it leave an impression on me. A lot of people, a lot of houses got hit by lightning uh, that night. So that was the first little wake-up call to weather. Um, you know, during first, second, third, fourth grade time, I was very much a science-minded kid. I was always reading, fiddling with electronics and radios, climbing trees to put up antennas to play with shortwave 
radio and stuff like that. All sorts of things. Later on, family moves to Feeding Hills, Massachusetts. This is on the other side of Springfield. I'll show you on a map earlier. And our house is narrowly missed by an F4. It's the second strongest category of tornado on October 3rd, 1979, which to date is still one of the most expensive tornadoes that has ever hit the United States. The reason it's so expensive partly is because it destroyed a whole bunch of, of, of antique aircraft. So here's the headlines from the Morning Union, October 4th, 1979, the day after. Um, it was a really big deal. Uh, and to, again, to date, this is one of a big, a big storm. Um, it was a very unusual storm. October in New England, supercell tornadoes, those things just don't really happen very often. Um, and it was a really interesting weather scenario that led to that storm. And a paper was written about it that sort of did a weather analysis. But it again, wow, weather is, you know, is crazy. We were just skirted by the edge of this thing. Um, our house did have some wind damage, or at least uh, a tree in our backyard did. So, you know, and if I'll pause here and show you also where Ludlow and Feeding Hills are. So our, my experience got hit by lightning was sort of on the northeast side of the greater metropolitan Springfield, Massachusetts area. And when I was uh, 11, actually very shortly after my 11th birthday in Feeding Hills, Massachusetts, a tornado came through. Um, my sister's school was impacted and she was in a different school than I was. But anyway... All worked out, at least in terms of us being safe. I just remember a lot of uh, damage, things blown around. Um, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. So I got to this point and I'm thinking, oh, before I go on, yeah, this was also a storm that really did take uh, the weather service by surprise. It was a really unusual situation. If the same thing happened today, it would have been a challenging event, to be quite honest. Um, but again, why it was such an expensive storm was because it destroyed a bunch of antique aircraft at Bradley International Airport. Okay, so maybe I should try to understand this thing that's trying to kill me. You know, at this point in my life, yeah, weather is, is on my radar as, as being interesting. So is astronomy. I had a telescope. I was looking at planets and watching them scoot across the sky because I didn't have a thing that would turn with the Earth. Archaeology, I went on an archaeological dig in junior high, won a little scholarship for that. So I had a lot of interest in different things. But it wasn't until I got to high school and started uh, taking courses in programming that really uh, things clicked. So I, I really liked programming. Or once I was exposed to programming, uh, I was like, this is, this is fun. So I <laughs> cut my teeth on old Apple IIEs. Um, I got myself a programmable calculator as a high school graduation present. Think of what normal people ask for high school graduation presents. Well, I asked for this. Um, HP 41CX programmable calculator. It even came with, uh, you could buy these little modules. Here it is. I know it's a beautiful thing. It still works. It just takes really weird batteries. Here's a little stat pack thing you can pop right in there. Oh, isn't that a wonderful modular thing? Um, and again, it works, but um, I don't use it anymore because it takes four size N batteries. I use this guy now, just a modern one. Uh, most of my programming is done in Python, C, or Fortran. Okay, so anyway, fun stuff. That, But that kind of puts you in my mindset, right? I was going to go to college. I knew I wanted to be a college professor, and I knew whether was, I was going to be a meteorologist because that's why I went to UW-Madison. At the time, the University of Illinois did not have an undergraduate meteorology program. They do, they do today. Um. So in college, oh boy, programming was even more fun because then I learned Pascal, or learned, I, I was exposed to, did a little bit of programming in Pascal, and then Fortran. So I took a course that was two-thirds Pascal, one-third Fortran 77. I was the kind of kid who would get the assignment in class and go straight to the computer lab and get it done in 12 hours and not eat maybe. You know, we're computery people, right? We're weird that way. Um in graduate school, um, I went, again, went to UW-Madison under John Anderson. I, I taught myself C. I did take a data structures class at one point, but I pretty much shared an office with a, with a guy who programmed in C. He had, uh, he had this wonderful book in his, uh, maybe an earlier version of this book right here. Um, notice it says, Do Not Remove for Fear of Death, because <laughs> very, very important book. Um, and, and that was really good because, you know, C could do like dynamic memory allocation. Fortran couldn't do things like that at the time. And it's just such a pain in the butt to have to recompile every time you change an array size. So that was one of the main things. Plus pointers. I was doing things in Fortran that really needed to be done with pointers. And um, the rest is kind of history. I still use Fortran quite a bit because that's what the model I use is in. And it is still a really good workhorse language for getting things done. 
Today, in the present day, my programming languages are primarily C, Python, uh, Fortran 2000, whatever, and, you know, shell scripting. Um, a few words about the other two categories of this, of this um, workshop that I'm not actually going to talk about. Uh, reproducible workflows, hugely important, of course. Uh, the whole LOFS system that I developed does actually contain workflows. I, again, I'm an atmospheric scientist. I often don't think in terms of, you know, computery things, but we have a pretty nice workflow and reproducibility is not so hard with our workflows. Essentially, we're just doing number crunching. The kind of number crunching we're doing isn't super sensitive uh, to the methods we use, unlike the model itself, which these atmospheric forecast models, small changes in the initial conditions lead to great changes down the road. And that's pretty much why I'm in this business because predict, predict, predicting is hard. You know, predict, the predictability of a storm and whether we can predict tornadoes is really what drives my research. Um, so as far as uh, reproducible workflows, we do have what I would call reproducible workflows. I'll talk a little bit about our, the whole workflow of our data in a moment. As far as security goes, um, so, oh, right, reproducibility and scientific uh, results is, of course, important and not always possible for the reasons I mentioned. One of the reasons is with numerical work, you literally cannot go back and rerun a simulation sometimes unless you have exactly the same compiler, exactly the same hardware. You know, it gets really hard to, to do this. Um, or you just use really, uh, a, um, I would say, conservative compiler options for doing mathematical operations, and it'll just make your model super slow. And that's a whole other issue, and I don't want to go down to that. But it's, it, in terms of security, all I will say about that is, you know, Globus, I use it all the time to transfer data. It's a very important part of my day-to-day -day workflow as far as sharing data with collaborators. Um, secure shell, PGP encryption, SSL, all that stuff, obviously, you know, those things are super important. And I say this kind of as a tongue-in-cheek, but I've just kind of come to grips with the fact. I, I do research with people who have uh, patents and things. I don't have patents. I'm probably never going to try to pursue a patent. I give everything away. I'm being paid by federal money. I feel like I should give stuff away. In fact, NSF makes you give stuff away. But all that aside, I have come to, I have, I have um, it, um, benefited so much from open source tools like Linux, ImageMagic, uh, the, the uh, GNU, the, the GIMP image editing program, all sorts. Of, I could just give a list, FFmpeg, um, all that stuff. I'm going to give my code away too. That's kind of how I look at it. So I, I didn't always do this, but all the code that I have worked on and my graduate student works on is on GitHub. And that's the right way to do it. And as it turns out, um, your, your fear of giving it all away is often unjustified because it turns out it's hard to use stuff that other people haven't been using for the last 10 years. And even if you help them, they're not going to, they're, I'm not sure you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot by giving your code away. I'm, I'm a very big proponent of giving things away, at least where I am now in my career. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. So again, this is, I'm, I'm building up to the whole point of this, the, the overarching picture of data management, why it's important. Because I've always, I never really thought it was data management. That's kind of what I've been doing for much of my career. In the early 1990s, I started, or 1990, I started my, um, my graduate career, as you want to call it. Um, I was a grad student from 1990 to 1997. I did not get a master's degree. I just worked on my PhD. It just turned out to be the most logical thing to do. When I started with John Anderson's group in 1990, they had just built the Wisconsin Model Engine, the WME. And I'll talk about that in a little bit because, you know, I, a lot of my philosophy and a lot of how I pursue things it, it can be stemmed back to this, this working on this kind of hardware. It was a transputer-based supercomputer, and it was homemade. I mean, uh, John Anderson and Michael Tobis, who was one of uh, John's students, built it. You know, they designed it and built it, um, and it was made out of transputers. And here's a paper that Rob Jacob, uh, who was a graduate student with me, who's now uh, working at Argonne in Chicago. John, Rob Jacob and John Anderson wrote this article, and I'm going to show you a little bit of this. The WME project demonstrates the applicability of massively parallel technology to real problems of geophysical interest. Um, this is back before we had supercomputing centers in 1992. I don't think we had supercomputing centers yet, or if they were, most, um, that's another whole story. Uh, you know, having things like Exceed and uh, the TerraGrid that preceded Exceed, that has been huge for scientists. Now we have shared resources you can apply for time and get it, rather than everybody building their own little cluster, which um, was kind of the way things were when, when I was uh, getting started. 
So this machine was, was pretty amazing for its time. Here is one of the boards. You can see the three transputers there and all the memory modules. Um, this is one of 68 boards. And here's sort of a schematic of, of how it was arranged. You see um, you've got 8x18 eight uh, grid, essentially a grid. You've had a host that essentially is where you're going to get all your data. It's a machine running Unix. It was an old Ultrix machine I, or uh, SGI machine. Um, the root processor. So this was the whole. You had your compute. You had your compute nodes essentially, and you had your root node that did all of the collecting and managing data. So if you look at, say, for instance, node seven comma seventeen out there, when it's time to save data, that data has to trickle down. It's like the bucket brigade getting stuff down to link zero zero and out to root and out to the host. It was slow. Oh my gosh, it was slow. I used to go upstairs and watch the blinking lights because in order to know what was going on, you had to sort of. The model wasn't too chatty, shall we say. Um, and looking at if, if things weren't working, you go upstairs and see if the machine had wedged. It's at least my John used to call it the machines wedged. So you'd have to turn it off and turn it on again. Something like that. It didn't happen that often, but it would occasionally. And then it was always like, oh gosh, is that a programming error? Or was it a what is it a a random neutrino or you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Okay, so a little bit about the machine. It says uh you know, it has a floating point process, a floating point processor using a CPU, four kilobytes of memory. Oh boy, four I/O links all on the same piece of silicon, and then it can address up to four gigabytes of RAM, twenty megabytes, twenty screaming megabytes per second. Now, and this is nineteen early nineteen nineties, but this was a big deal. Um, another line from the paper: uh, the big hardware question. And this sentence right here is still is sort of how I approach things when it comes to managing data. The question for designing the machine, in my case, it would be designing a program or maybe a, this file system thing. What combination of array size, three-dimensional array size, and memory per transputer, okay, because you got to map it, uh, will give the best cost performance ratios at the grid resolutions we want to run for the problems we want to solve? Now, that's a very, you can pick that sentence apart quite a bit. But essentially, you put an awful lot of thought into your hardware because you have to develop software for this stuff. Um, and this is what John came up with. John decided to do. Uh, my favorite line from the whole paper is the one that describes what it looks like. And it reads as the appearance of the WME may be best described as functional. <laughs> and yeah, it was just a rack with a bunch of, uh, fans, loud fans, very fast rotating, small fans, all that are just a little bit out of sync. So it sounded like a swarm of hornets. Uh, it was pretty bad, but anyway, it was stashed away in a cold room, so very few people actually had to uh, to deal with the machine, which was good. So here's a little uh, a movie that we made about the WME, um, some of the science that it can do. Uh, if, you, if you notice closely, yes, this is an old VHS rip because I no longer have the original files, but this is a short thing that John made um, about the WME. Here we are talking about the size of the problem we're trying to solve and the domain, and here's what you're seeing in these two blue blobs here. These are, uh, it's potential temperature rise to surface. You're seeing cold air sinking as it falls from a thunderstorm, a uh, highly uh, parameterized thunderstorm. We're just looking at the cold air and it sinks, hits the ground, spreads out and interacts. And that was my PhD thesis. Looked at what happened when microbursts or downbursts interact with one another. And here's uh, a thunderstorm simulation. It was based upon the Plainfield tornado um, of 1990. John took a sounding from that, and we didn't really pursue this particular s simulation very much, but he coded up uh, some microphysics, and he did this, but it's pretty amazing. Uh, we were running 250-meter uh, grid spacing back in 91 on this machine, and it, it did a pretty good job. So this was my first experience with HPC. Um, it was not easy to program. Thankfully, John had already programmed it, and um, there was no MPI. There was no uh, NetCDF yet. John used a custom-built uh, output format called C hist. I think there was an A hist and a B hist, and this is the one he settled on. It used runline encoding for com to compress losslessly, but it also used scale offset compression to com to uh, bring it down uh, to 16 bits. You know, you know how scale offset works. It's a lossy form of compression. It's not the best, but it had to be done, and because data just moves so slowly uh, out of the machine. The first two months of my graduate career, I wrote a piece of code uh, that converted the CHIST format to the Viz5D format, which is the format that the uh, software Viz5D uses, and it worked. And within, so John now could look at his data and interact with it. He was 
he liked that. He was impressed with it, I guess. And then he gave me more money. To, uh, in other words, I got uh, bumped up my appointment to 75% as a project assistant. So I would work with John to do programming things um, that not, weren't necessarily associated with my, my PhD. And that was great. So in other words, the, the, me the le message here, the lesson is, wow, uh, programming is fun. I'm kind of good at it. And people think it's important enough what I'm doing to pay me more. I'm going to continue to pursue this. That was some, a really good motivator. Now, uh, before I finished my PhD in 1997, NetCDF and MPI had been invented, thankfully. And the WME had been replaced with uh, what we call a Beowulf cluster, uh, a bunch of PCs that are linked together through probably a 10 or 100 megabit switch. Um, and that was much, much easier to program, much easier to bug, et cetera, et cetera. But now we've got multiple machines, distributed memory, um, just like the WME. But now we have like we have you know a kernel on each one of these things. You know, it's a little more sophisticated. Um, at this point in time, I was I've always wanted to make data look good, and I started using a ray tracer called the Persistence Vision Ray Tracer, which I was very happy to find out as I researched this. Um, it's still around. It's still being used. It's still being developed. So, my hats off to the Pavre developers and all the folks who've been involved in that. Here's a figure from my PhD thesis showing uh, the same thing as before in, in black and white with the ISIS surfaces showing the cold air from a downburst. These are uh, the one at the top that kind of looks like a pacifier. Um, that is when you just have no atmospheric winds uh, in the atmosphere and you just drop the cold air out of the clouds. So just a quiescent state. These are all highly idealized. Then you start making it more realistic and you start having the cloud move because there's wind shear in the environment and it starts to deform the downburst. And then you look at how the winds are are distributed in this, and, and that was part of part of the work I did. Uh, this is some uh, one vis five D uh, slide to show you. Uh, now this is again, it doesn't look as good. It doesn't do anti aliasing. I love anti aliasing, <laughs> making everything look smooth and nice. Um, you can see the sharp, jaggy edges, but this was interactive, and it to this day, again, this five D is still it's written in OpenGL, and it's still being used today at UW Madison. This is stuff that was written in the nineties. It blows my mind. Um, so hats off to Bill Hibbert, Brian Paul, and all the folks who wrote Viz 5D, and, and it's still being used today. So, okay, I got my PhD. At this point, um, it turns out that microbursts, the problem that my thesis was associated with, were kind of considered a solved problem. The FAA had discovered them. We had put in terminal Doppler weather radars at airports. Pilots were trained to deal with them. So if you're going to pursue your own you know, academic career at this point, microbursts might not have been a good choice for me. So I knew I had to switch my subject, which is always fun. I wasn't quite ready to leave UW at the time. My, my advisor had left. John was uh, out working for IL, uh, Industrial Light and Magic at the time. But I, he had some funding, and I transitioned over to a ocean project that was from, again, you got to work with the funding you've got, and I hadn't gotten on my own yet. So I converted the model to a, a convection ocean convection model to study what happens, say, in the Greenland Sea when very cold, salty water sinks to the bottom. It's part of the North Atlantic forms North Atlantic deep water. It's part of the thermal haline circulation. If I remember, it's been a while, <laughs> but very important for climate. Uh, very, very, I almost did a climate PhD, if you can believe it. Um, but I, I didn't. So anyway, um, I did that, worked on that for a couple of years. At this point, I'm looking, I'm doing some job hunting and I, I got a job at UNC Asheville in, in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina, Western North Carolina, up in the mountains near the Blue Ridge. Um, I was there for three years. After my first year, I was ready to get back into research, and I, that's when I picked up the phone and called Dr. Robert Wilhelmson, who I had done some work with before um, on the, uh, uh, some other modeling projects that were funding me earlier. And I began what turned out to be a very long collaboration with Dr. Wilhelmson, uh, Bob. And he's retired now, uh, doing fine, and I owe a whole lot of my uh, career to, uh, to working with Bob. And he supported me when I needed it, and, and I was the guy who was useful. <laughs> you know? um, and in fact, when I started at CMU, you know, I'm, I'm now on the tenure track again. I've got teaching to do, a you know, very busy time. Faculty know what I'm talking about. It's hard when you're teaching three courses, uh, undergrad courses a semester, to get a whole lot of research done. But I kept, I kept pushing, and I kept my contacts. So my advisor, I had no contact with my advisor because he was out of academia, but I had someone who was, you know, as good or better, you know, in terms of what he could do. He, uh, Bob was doing some work on the Blue Waters machine, or he was going to, and that's what really got my research going. But this is long before then. Um, the first paper I wrote when I was on the tenure track, I guess this would have been at CMU, was um, for Linux Journal. Wonderful journal, by the way. It's kind of 
died and come back to like three times already. It's still kind of out there. Um, but I love the Linux journal. I still do. It's just, just really fun to read. And there's all sorts of practical stuff in there. I always, it's always something good. Anyway, I wrote an article. I thought, why not? Cause this is like, um, this is like, I felt like, you know, I took open source code, I modified it and I'm, I want to publish this in the Linux journal. So anyway, I took the Pavre and used, uh, there's a gentleman, his last name is Suzuki. I think he's a Japanese researcher who had written an ISA surface patch and I needed an ISA surface cause that's how I think of, uh, things. When you look at this, this actual cover, you see a white, red, and blue ISA surfaces in green. Those are just values, contours, you can think, three-dimensional contours of cloud, hail, rain, and um, I believe or updraft, the, the vertical motion of the wind. Here's another picture. This is the one I thought I wanted to go on the cover, but I, they did a good job. They picked the right one with the, with the um, parcels flying around. The little balls represent the motion of the air, or a, fro a freeze frame of the motion of the air. But that's not too bad for for this time. Now here's a here's what I did. Uh, I part of my startup. I got uh, a little cluster to to do modeling and rendering on. And this is this is one of the things I just rendered frames and then stuck them together. And at the top here, you can see the cloud, the updraft, rain, hail. The bottom, you see just some of those fields. Um, here, I am watch uh, following the motion of the air. I do this though by using history data. So this is HDF four data. I wrote code that. Uh, goes into the data and interpolates in space and time. I used splines. I was big on splines back there. Everything was in was splines when I interpolated in space. And I had four-dimensional spline interpolants all over the place uh, to make things look smooth. And partly it's just because I was unsatisfied with, with the jaggy nature of things. We weren't running at high enough resolution, but the computers hadn't been invented that to do what I wanted to do yet. But this was, and here's three different views of, uh, of these flying around. It's kind of fun. Um, by the way, I made stereo pairs for all this stuff, and we got a geo wall. This is when I was at CMU. The students who put on the 3D glasses and watch this stuff, watch the balls fly at them. Woo! As you get towards the end here, you'll see they kind of come at you. So you can imagine this would look pretty cool with stereo glasses on, and it was. <laughs> Not so sure it was educational so much, but it was fun. Um, but yeah, so that was something I did. Again, not a lot of people were doing stuff at this uh, spatial and temporal resolution. So, but it never really went anywhere. Um, I was f studying a storm that was kind of problematic and I did get some research published on that work, but it wasn't, you know, eventually I, I, I started trying different things, but my approaches I could still use. I could use, try a different storm and I could use Pavre to render it. So, um, a big, big deal for me was, uh, when I was introduced to George Bryan, who writes the CM1 model, George Bryan is a scientist at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And his CM1 cloud model is the primary research cl cloud model used today in atmospheric science, I would say, for doing highly idealized studies. Um, I was at a point where I was either going to get paid to convert the model I was using into an MPI model, or I was going to have to find another model. And thankfully, George Bryan had already done most of the hard work. He had already created a model that was based on the MM5 from Penn State, a mesoscale model from Penn State. You may have heard of it, maybe not. I have to remember, I'm not talking to atmospheric scientists necessarily. But he took that model and um, he made it into a massively parallel using MPI model, also with OpenMP, very important. The short story was, I didn't have to do all that stuff, and the model actually had better physics in it too. So I started using that model like crazy. Um, I also did my sabbatical at NCAR, and, and at NCAR, uh, that's when I really came up with the, with the uh, modern techniques that I use today. Basically, I was trying to, I wanted to simulate tornadoes naturally. I wanted them to form in the simulation. I wanted to watch them form. I wanted to like, as if you were out on a chase. In order to do that, you have to save a ton of data so that it doesn't just, you know, you, every 30 seconds, you just have a frame, right? So I wanted frames, like multiple frames per second if possible. So I knew I had to get a handle on IO, and IO was killing us. I tried different processes. I was, you know, I was really big on parallel HDF5, like, okay, this is going to solve all my problems. All I have to do is let it handle everything. Um, it, it didn't, the performance is poor. I tried, okay, I'm going to learn about MPI communicators. I'll break the domain. I'll use an MPI com split and I'll make these new communicators save files, but each one will be in parallel. Clever, right? Yeah. You get multiple, yeah, it's still not very good performance at this point. Um, so I kind of said, well, I'm just not going to use parallel IO anymore. Um, I need to do serial IO in parallel. And then I discovered what's called the core driver for HDF5. This is a driver that lets you build the uh, files in memory. And I 
over the years, I just worked on this process. I rank, I did rank reordering to get uh, the hardware and software mapped properly, the way to make this work. I buffer to memory. I write one file per node, not per rank. And I also buffer a bunch of times. And it ends up creating a very good system for doing large amounts of IO and not breaking the bank. So you can save lots of data and it doesn't make up most of your compute time. Because if you want to run on supercomputers and it takes you know 10 minutes to write a data set, you're not going to run on supercomputers. They're not going to let you. You have to show that your model is efficient enough to justify being on a machine like that. So I've got IO pretty much down, you know, and that's not easy. Believe me, it took years to get this to work. And it's mostly based on trial and error, experimentation, and just, you know, stubbornness. <laughs> Um, so if you, let's just think of a, uh, Frontera, the supercomputer I'm using, it has, um, eight cores. I'm sorry. It has 56 cores per node. We decompose the problem into having, uh, eight MPI ranks per node, each rank having seven open MP threads. And you may say, well, why don't you just use one MPI rank and then have a 56 threads? It just doesn't perform as well there. Uh, MPI is very good with shared with shared memory. It's it's been written to re recognize when you're doing things that could be done with shared memory operations. So I'm okay with this. Everyone seems to be fine with it. Now, when you submit your job, the typical way that the the jobs are mapped, the MPI ranks are mapped to the hardware is what's often called SMP node. I've seen it's just if you look on the left, the bottom left, node one goes one through eight, node two goes nine through sixteen, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want the rank the MPI ranks to map the hardware so it's a nice 2D grid. So I have to do rank reordering. And if you look to the on the right now, uh, node one, uh, look at node one and two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you see how it's just a nice XY grid. So now every single node has a nice continuous chunk of three-dimensional data. You could look at little pieces of the data just by saving data from that node. The ranks that are circled, 1, 3, 17, and 19, those are the ranks that actually handle IO. They're not dedicated ranks, they're doing computation as well. Um, but I just break, everybody collects data, buffers data. And it actually works out really well. It is not, uh, it may not be, uh, you know, it just works. That's all I can say. And I'm for practicality. You know, if <laughs> if it works, let's let's go with it. Okay, so one day I sat down and I also just decided, how do I want the files to lie on disk? And I came up with something that looked like this. I just scribbled it out on my notebook, um, a top level history file data, uh, 2D data for two, uh, 2D directory for 2D files, and I've gotten rid of those. That's that's I'll explain why in a minute. A 3D directory for all 3D data, and then within the 3D directory, there's a bunch of directories that contain times of a certain range, and within each of those time directories, there's a series of directories. In each of those directories, there's the actual data. Okay, so it's directories. It's kind of like a tree structure. The idea here is I am exploiting the parallel file system. I'm writing data. In using serial operations, but they're happening in parallel, concurrently. So the file system is having all these files being written at the same time. And it turns out this is very efficient. I'm not doing any MPI parallel stuff where there's multiple writers going to one file. Each file has one writer. And you're still parallelizing like crazy because you've got perhaps, you know, a couple thousand nodes, maybe, you know, uh, so it, and it works. It works really well. So I kind of had to then figure out how I was going to do that. <laughs> and I got something that worked. It turns out there were bugs galore <laughs> when I had a good result. So at this point, this is around 2014 or so, um, I've been on the Blue Waters machine for a few years. I've been developing code. I've worked with Bob to get more allocations. And we ran out of time. We ended up having to get another allocation. We barely got that allocation, and we're coming to the end of that one, and we really needed a really good result at this point. I mean, at this point, I've been getting, you know, performance is good, performance is good, we have no big result. Well, I got a big result, okay? This is where it really starts. So for me, and you can watch this talk on my YouTube channel, um, this was November 2nd, or November 2014, I think it's a day off. Um, I got this wonderful tornado. You can see the track and the velocity field on top, pressure field on the bottom. It was 100. 65 miles long, looked beautiful. I mean, look at that. I mean, this is crazy. Uh, vorticity, the streamwise vorticity current, new discovery, that thing off to the right there, the tornado. I let parcels go, they're flying around. Basically, I sat down in my basement like I am now for a week and, and learned Final Cut Pro, like I'm using now, to get all my stuff together. And it was a 
13 minute talk, I think. And I just timed it all out and I hit play at the podium and I just talked. And then I put the video, the audio back on later. Anyway, it was a big deal. You can, again, you can see that, but what made, and here's really what I want you to hear. And I'm not, and this is actually absolutely the truth. What made this work, especially impactful. It wasn't just that I had managed to get this tornado which was a big deal in and of itself because it required a very big chunk of a very big supercomputer. But I saved a ton of data in time and space at very high resolution. And I was able to do that because I was using what I would consider good data management uh, practices. I used compression. I saved not too many files per directory. I used metadata up the wazoo, both in the file names and in the files themselves. You know, so all this stuff, and I didn't even know what the words data management or file system, I wasn't thinking in those terms. I was just trying to get stuff to work. And it did. And it was a big deal. Now, um, so, yeah, uh, we. I, this is what's really important, of course. I'm a scientist. I got to publish, right? Um, and I'm not going to lie, making pretty pictures helps. I mean, these movies help. Not do they only, they don't only help me understand what's going on and, and help me make new discoveries as a scientist, but it, it, it's striking. A lot of this stuff draws the eye, it draws attention and it gets people interested. And I really do enjoy sharing my work with people uh, as I am with you guys. So anyway, um, that's why I've had fun with YouTube. It's the only form of social media I use. I post all my talks online and I, uh, I interact, starting to interact more with folks who ask questions and, and it's, it's great. I love it. Um, it's really nice to have a, a nice direct connection to, to your audience. So I, and that's lo lovely article, great article. You can read it again. I got links at the end of a talk you can look at. Um, basically by prioritizing IO performance, we were able to save data at a very high frequency. So I would save data every one or two seconds in that original work. I've saved data as frequently as five Hertz. Uh, in other words, every two tenths of a second, um, on a much bigger simulation. So, uh, the supercomputers continue to get better and my code continues to be refined and works really well. So in the present day and kind of getting to the main point of all this, um, so I have, oh, here's the thing. So I've refactored the code four times. I think the first time I just, you know, did a bunch of HDF files and just wrote one per MPI rank in CM1. Then I scrapped that entire code. I did this four times the last, and I have to say this, this is why not too many scientists are doing what I'm doing because scientists want to do science. They don't want to fart around with programming. Generally speaking, unless you're weird, like I am, I actually enjoy programming. Um, so I, it was actually the beginning of the pandemic. I talked to my graduate student, Kelton Halbert, who's also a real good programmer. And we both refactored. We decided we were just going to refactor the, the LOFS code and make it inter integrate better with his code as well. And uh, a good thing to do at the beginning of a pandemic, quite honestly, where you just lock yourself in the basement and code for hours and hours and hours. So this last time was great. I mean, I, it, it's all written in C. Uh, I, I kind of wish I knew C++ sometimes for object-oriented stuff, but it's all C. And um, I, it's more object-oriented now. We've made it more uh, readable and usable. Easier to, to inter interact with the, with the software. We standardized the API. And it's easy to hook into the data. You don't have to convert it first, although um, that's one of the main things I do with this code is to convert to NetCDF files or HDF files because they're very, uh, very widely used in atmospheric science. I can share my data. Kelton Halbert, my graduate student, has written code to do trajectory analysis that reads right off of LOFS data. Um, all this stuff now works and it's pretty stable. So we're really excited. It's been a long slog to get to where we are. Now, um, just two weeks ago, I my research was on the cover of Science Magazine um, for a study that was led by uh, another uh, faculty person. I just wanted to mention this. That's crazy. <laughs> All right. Morgan O'Neill, uh, she was a postdoc um, at the University of Chicago, and she invited me to give a talk a few years ago on supercells, and she asked me a question at the end of my talk about the top of the storm and whether I had thought about looking at the top of the storm more. And it was something I've been thinking about doing for a very long time. Our, so immediately I was like, let's talk. And we started a collaboration, um, almost all of it remote. Um, and it led to, uh, to a, a very um, impactful publication. I hope it just came out, but here's what it's about. So in uh, there's it, it's about a feature of some supercell thunderstorms called an above anvil cirrus plume. And if you look at this image here, uh, OT stands for overshooting top. So that's at the, uh, shows you where the updraft of the storm is punching into the stratosphere. Uh, downwind or towards the east-northeast of the overshooting top in several of these storms, you can see 
what looks like a sort of a smoky looking plume at the top above the anvil, the flat pancake like surface of, of the of the real anvil. That's called an above anvil cirrus plume. And it turns out those things are associated with severe weather in a pretty major way. About three quarters of them, um, storms that exhibit AACPs are either producing large hail or tornadoes. So they're of great interest. And there's been a lot of research on them. Um, they were only named a few years ago, uh, given an actual name of above anvil cirrus plume. Um, and what Morgan and I did is we went back to some earlier work done by um, Holmeyer at the University of Oklahoma, and we took his uh, simulation uh, sounding that he produced, and we used it as our initial condition. So in other words, this is another great uh, example of sharing data. And, 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 you know, when people have supplementary material in modeling studies, I'm going to go look at that stuff. So we basically reconducted his simulations at Eddy, Eddy, uh, large Eddy simulation uh, resolution. And it turns out that we discover what produces AACPs, at least in this model, is a hydraulic jump. And it's a hydraulic jump that exists without a mountain or out anything. You know, there's, there's only the cloud. And I think this is the first time a hydraulic jump has been observed absent any topography or only up. In, in, a, in a fluid, like up in, in the atmosphere at this point. In this case, it's the overshooting top that acts like the mountain and the air screams down the mountain, screams down the overshooting top. And I'll show you some video of this in a second. Um, but anyway, I could not have done any of this if I hadn't already done my due diligence with data and made sure I could save this data. And this image, the cover of science, you'll notice that plume that's beneath the AAS logo. That's something like an above anvil cirrus plume. This is a tropical cloud. It's not a supercell, but it looks really nice. It's it's lit internally by lightning. Um, an airline pilot who who takes pictures of these things uh, has a nice, it's really nice pictures of clouds. But here's a movie. Here's here's data. This is saved every second. I can save data as as frequently as every model time step for this simulation. But watch what happens. This is the ice field of the cloud shaded by velocity. And look at that. It's a breaking wave, right? Sure looks like a breaking wave to me. Well, that's the initiation of the hydraulic jump. You're seeing all the turbulence. Here's another view, kind of a, a cross section through it. That smiley face thing to the left in the bottom there is the jet wind exceeding 90 meters per second. And here's all the moisture being blasted upward into the stratosphere. And this is one more view showing the cloud and vorticity. You'll see that as the hydraulic jump kicks in, all that vorticity it represents all the turbulence that's going on, and it's injecting that moisture in the form of ice and water vapor into the stratosphere. And we identified this process. I mean, there it is. And that's another reason why I like doing this animation stuff and visualization is you can just show people this. Um, you don't have to argue about what that is. You just show it to people, right? If you don't like what it shows, argue with the model. That's what I always say. Anyway, okay, so currently um, we have... LOFS working pretty well. Um, it works only with the CM1 model. It could be adapted to other models. We write one file per node. Files contain as much as 50 to 100 time levels per file, and those are all buffered to memory. Nothing hits the file system until you close the file and boom, down she goes. So you got lots of big files coming down at the same time, nice and compressed. Supercomputers do a really good job at that sort of thing. And I could not have done any of this if I had not used lossy compression. And this talk, I could do a whole talk on lossy compression, but what you're seeing here is the result of utilizing ZFP lossy compression, which is being used as a plugin for the HDF5 file format, which is the underlying format of LOFS. So I'm able to get data to compress very well. This is from a recent paper I wrote. Um, I, I, I'm mapping out uh, the percentage of the final file size as a function of what it would have been had it been 32-bit uncompressed data. Um, and you'll see with, with some of the stuff, you're getting 5%, so that's 20 to 1 compression ratio. ratio. With pressure, you're seeing really you know 30 to 1. Some variables, it varies. The short, I'm, I'm just going to not go too much into this. Uh, into this diagram, but the idea is I'm using lossy compression. I'm using it in an intelligent way. I'm specifying the amount of error I'm willing to tolerate for any of the variables, and then the ZFP compression will go forth and compress uh, and maintain that. It's, it's a dynamic compression approach, which is great because you get super high compression ratios where there's a lot of constant values, and, and there's always areas of your domain that are pretty boring, and they compress really well. So again, sort of coming to the end of this, and what is this what is this all coming down to here? Um, it's that by paying attention to how data, data is being generated, handled, organized, stored, accessed, 
Just by doing that and using an existing tool, the CM1 model has been around for 15 years. It's free for all scientists to use. I am just one scientist using the model. I don't have any privilege to the model. I've written some code that has ended up in the model because I work with George, but the point is um, it's just out there. So I, adapt, I, I decided I'm just going to do this myself because I have a specific thing I'm trying to do that requires it. So I was motivated, you know, and I like computers enough as an atmospheric scientist that I could do this and still not go completely crazy. And also my colleagues, um, you know, still recognize me as an atmospheric scientist, not a computer scientist who programs rather mediocre, <laughs> a mediocre program. I don't know. I program stuff that works. Um, I don't know. The code's out there. You can look at it yourself. So if I had to sort of summarize the, the approach and how this really uh, relates to this conference is that, you know, the approach for LOFS, and I'll also put in uh, Kelton's code that does the Lagrangian partial analysis from the LOFS data, all 3D, da all 3D arrays are going to be compressed that you save. They're going to be, and they're going to be compressed lossal, lossal, lossally. They're going, you're going to be removing bits. Okay. You're just going to have to learn to live with that. And I'm, I say this to scientists more than anything. There's nothing inherently special about 32 bits of precision or 64 bits or even 128 bits or even 16. You can, you know, you can declare 16 bit floats. So don't tell me that just because we're doing some, you know, lossy compression that we're, you know, it's, it's the end of the world. It's not. Um, but you have to be careful and you have to have a lot of uh, forethought into this and you need to make sure that you're not going to regret compressing your data in a way that results in messing up your science. And ZFP has been great for that. I encourage you to all look into that uh, if you're trying to, if it's something that could benefit your own research. So we compress the data, we buffer data when we write, so we avoid the latency of all involved with hitting a file system, especially a shared file system when somebody else is dumping you know, a terabyte of data to disk. It's going to impact the network. So you buffer to memory because when you're pushing just to memory, you're the only one on that node, and it's going to go fast. Um, only save the variables you need. And one approach in science is to save you know, do all your calculations while you're holding things in memory and then save it all to disk. I only save what I need and then we do the calculations later. Um, I do that to save data, to make the model run faster. Also, only save the subdomain you need. Much analysis is local. You don't always need to save your full domain. Or at least I've discovered I don't need to always save my full domain. So really, it's the combination of high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution in save data. So saving all the data, getting it on disk, you have to get the data on disk. I don't want to have to be running a supercomputer, running a model on a supercomputer in order to be doing my stuff. I'd much rather be using GPUs or a, or a workstation. But it turns out that analysis doesn't always scale the way that the simulations do, thankfully. You can do your analysis on a much more modest bit of hardware than run your model. But that's how I did it. Um, and let me just sort of close up. And say that, you know, um, again, thanks for your attention. Thanks for the, the invite to do this. Um, by and large, I'm a scientist and I'm thinking, you know, this has been from my scientific perspective. Um, by and large, science, scientists want to do science and things like data management are a bother. I've worked with brilliant scientists who don't know how to open up a VI editor. You know, I mean, that sort of thing. <laughs> okay, Emacs, whatever. The point is, we want, they want to do science. Oftentimes the compute stuff is a bother or it's something that just doesn't they want someone else to handle that. I've made it my business to be the one who handles a lot of that. Partly cuz I enjoy it. I'm a weirdo. I actually enjoy programming, thinking of these, thinking of how we can use supercomputers to do things that to, to make new discoveries. And that's really how I approach the world. If I had become an astronomer or even a biologist or something, I probably would have done the same basic approach of using supercomputers to um to make new discoveries. So I understand that, um, but I'm sorry, in this big data era, we're heading towards exascale computing. How you manage your data is going to maybe determine the success, success of your project or even whether you actually get to access that machine in the first place. If you haven't thought about data and you're going to be on an exascale machine, you know, you're going to have to prove yourself. You have to got to think of these things. And it's not always going to be done for you, I'm afraid. I would like to see the atmospheric science community and, and other communities as well embrace lossy compression more, maybe as much as even loss, loss less compression. That's a tall order, but it is a goal of mine. 
Um, and again, thank you so much for your attention. I do want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation who supports me, the Space Science and Engineering Center who has gotten me through some low funding of, uh, times, um, the University of Wisconsin where I work, the Graduate College. My collaborators are listed there. Um, so thank you so much. And let me say I do have a bunch of supplemental material that you can check out at this link. Links to papers and videos and such. And this talk itself, even though I'm giving it yesterday, um, should be up on there as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I will now pause a day ago and I will now uh, answer any questions you might have uh, in, uh, in real time. So thank you very much.